Hey, since you're listening to an episode on the ultimate guide to reading and retaining books, before we jump into that episode, I wanted to point you to two other resources that you may find valuable. First is last week's episode was entitled Books for Your 2020 Reading List, and it's a short episode, 18 minutes in length, about my favorite books from 2019 that you can consider for your reading list this year. And I've broken it up into categories of best leadership book, best fiction, nonfiction, I think you'll like it. And then also on our website, doinnerwork.com, there's a resources tab that has three book lists that Brian and I have curated for you, 18 books that every business leader must read, 12 books that every man must read, and 15 books written by women that we love. You can go download those for free at doinnerwork.com forward slash resources. That's doinnerwork.com forward slash resources. Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting-edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose-driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to The Great Man Podcast. Have you ever felt frustrated by investing eight to 10 hours in reading a book only to feel its lessons slipping away as each day goes by. Unless you're Rain Man, I'm pretty sure you can relate. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the sheer amount of books that you, quote, need to read that other people tell you about? I personally have a queue of over 30 books that I've already purchased that are sitting here screaming for my attention. And I gotta admit, sometimes that feels overwhelming. So today's episode is all about simplifying your unique process for selecting books and which books you're going to invest your time in reading, and also a few practical techniques to ensure that you retain more of the information that you absorb. Here to help us do that today is Giovanni Beckford. Now, Giovanni is a software engineer at Google and a disciple of the systems and habit-based approach to living an optimal lifestyle. This guy is a machine. I spent three hours in a van with Giovanni on our way to a men's retreat a few months back, and when he started talking about his elaborate and ingenious process for selecting, reading, and retaining 60 books a year, I knew that I needed to bring him to you guys. So in this episode, you're going to learn about why you need and how to develop an intentional process for determining which books you say yes to, which are a six to 10 hour investment of your time every time why you need what Giovanni calls a book purgatory, a place where potential books that you may read go to meet their judgment day, and why one and five star reviews on Amazon are just noise, and why the well-written three star reviews hold the biggest clues as to whether you should read the book, and finally, why the factors of which medium you choose to read your book in, like hard copy, Kindle, or audiobook, and which context that you read the book in, like on the train or in your bed first thing in the morning, are essential to you retaining that information. Enjoy the episode. Giovanni, buddy, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Man, it's so good to see you again. So, Brian, I was just telling you that Giovanni and I had a chance to meet as we were headed up to a men's retreat a few weekends ago, and there were six of us in a van on like a two and a half hour drive up to the Catskills and everyone was pretty talkative. Giovanni was kind of just sitting there listening for the first hour or so. And then the topic of books came up. He started talking about how many books he devours in a year and then his process for how he chooses his books and reads his books. And do you know, like when someone starts talking and you're like, holy shit, this person is wicked smart. This guy, like, this guy is on it. Yeah. Like the whole, yes. the whole, the whole van stopped And we just started asking Giovanni questions about what books are you reading? How are you remembering the information? And so I was like, this would be a perfect guest for our show. So Giovanni, thank you for making time available so quickly to do this because I think this is going to be one of the first episodes of January and and we have a lot of voracious book readers in our audience. So you're going to be giving them a blueprint on how they could choose books more effectively and retain information more effectively. I'm pumped about this. I've got three books I haven't started, about three other books hardcover books that I'm reading, two audiobooks going at the same time, and I think one on Kindle. And it's chaos. It's pure chaos, Giovanni. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I hope your systems can help out some of this. Oftentimes on this podcast, I'm the one doing it wrong. And I'm glad to have you here to provide some guidelines. So here we go. Well, all those different books and all those different um, mediums and times are, are not too chaotic. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit how I <laughs> manage reading like six books in parallel. So Goodness. Yeah, that's actually okay. good to have that kind of momentum. Making me feel better already. Yeah. Be prepared to be blown away by the meticulousness of this, Brian. So Giovanni, set the stage for us. How many books do you read cover to cover on an annual basis and how long have you been doing it for? Yeah. So currently I read on an average 60 books a year. Those books are cover to cover. Um, so I don't skip around in a book. I'll read it linearly uh, from front to back. Uh, before I get to a book, I have a very strict process about figuring out whether I should read a book or not. The reason why is because I have a lot of friends who will recommend a book or people will talk about different types of books. Usually they're biased by things that are heavily promoted, things that are most likely to be on the bestseller list. Um, but there are a lot of hidden gems, these kind of hidden books that people don't talk about too often that have the potential to just rock your world. And those are usually the type of books that I want to carve out time to read. But it, the process that I've developed for that is what I call a book purgatory. And a book purgatory is where books go to await judgment day, literally. <laughs> so awesome. if someone gives me a book to read, like, oh, Giovanni, check out this book by such and such. I'll first think, okay, is this book worth the time of me taking out my phone, adding it to a list? The reason why I want to have some barrier is because you'll have, you know, we keep lists, maybe a to-do list or some other list, and they'll just rack up all these tasks and items. So every book that you add to your list is more noise that you add. right? And so I want to have a pre-curation before it even gets to the list. And so when you're in purgatory, that's kind of like this middle ground. And so I want to figure out a book, okay, is this book going to hell or is it a hell yes? And I'm trying to read hell yes books. And so I'll put it on my list and then I'll go to the reviews and I like Goodreads. And so Goodreads is a social uh, book site where people can discover and recommend other people books. And the reason why I like Goodreads over Amazon is because Goodreads uh, reviewers are very, very prideful about the reviews that they uh, provide. And on Amazon, there's this subtle gamification approach creeping in where uh, authors will try to get a bunch of people to rate five-star book reviews. All those five-star book reviews actually add a lot of noise, additional noise to the, the creation process of figuring out, okay, is this book worthwhile for me? Javon, really, really quick question on this before we get, so I, I just learned about Goodreads two minutes before we hit the record button here. Yeah. And I feel like I do this for wine tasting. I do this for movies on IMDb and I'm pumped to hear that there's a place to do this for reading now on Goodreads. I'm curious. So you, every time a book is recommended, do you immediately go to Goodreads or is there a decision before you go to Goodreads and look at the reviews? So it, well, I'll only go on Goodreads if it's on my purgatory list and if it's high priority. I see. Okay. Got it. Then you go to the reviews. Okay. So there's, there's already, it's already passed at least one or two tests before you're even into Goodreads. Correct. Got it. And there are certain people that will add a book directly to their list in Goodreads. And I'm going to use the word noise a lot. It's like it adds a lot of noise to Goodreads. Um, when you have all these books that you have to further sift through in your own list of what you want to read next. So I think of it as progressive curation. You want to help reduce the noise and to reduce the decision paralysis of choosing what to read next. And you can do that by having steps to curate your list before it even hits your list. Right on. Now, you're going to be blown away by like the diversity and the scope and the breadth of the types of books that Giovanni reads. Before we get into that, man, I think it's really helpful for people to understand your why. Like, why do you have such a systematized approach to reading? And also, why did you start devouring books? And what did that do for you in your life? Yes, I think the why is very important. There's another book, Start With Why. <laughs> and for me, the why I love to read comes down to a core of I'm very curious about myself, curious about the world, curious about others. And the reason for that curiosity is I didn't have the opportunity for much novelty as a child. I was in this environment. I grew up in the Bronx, raised by a single mom in the hood. I grew up like in the hood. In those environments, there's a lot of sameness. There's a lot of this feeling of being stuck in time. I didn't have the right resources. I didn't have the right mentors. My world was closed off. It felt like a prison. 
So looking through the bars, these kind of like psychological bars that I was behind and in my environment, I had to really fight to be curious. I had to really fight to think that there was more beyond the city block that I was living on. And that world opened up for me in, I would say, in small spurts. At first, there was a lot of resistance. Reason being in that scarce environment, there was I had a lot of pressure from my mom to do well in school. But that pressure was kind of in the form of forcing education on me, forcing books on me. So I actually hated reading hmm. for a very long time. I despised reading because whenever I did anything that was like out of hand, I would get in trouble and the punishment was actually to go read books. Huh, wow. So my, my video games were taken away from me, TV was shut off, and I had to go read books. So for the longest, reading was associated with the punishment. If I do bad, then I'll have to read. And going through school in the early education system, our summer reading list or summer reading was always these dry classic books. And I didn't understand why I needed to read them. And so that was even more aversion towards reading. And people would usually go to Spark Notes and not read the book to try to get a quick fix, a quick summary mm-hmm. um, so that they could avoid reading. What happened for me was when I started meeting certain people outside of my social circle that seemed to know a lot about things about outside of the normal confines of the poverty or like the city block, about the world at large. And not just through TV, it was through books. And what I found was that uh, someone can spend a whole lifetime writing a book and it may take like eight hours to read. Mm. Um, from a pure risk analysis, if you can find the right book, you have a very low downside and a very high upside. And the trade-off of time investment and the acquired knowledge through that, it just opens up so much optionality. And for me, cartoons actually help to bridge the gap in the importance of a wide knowledge and cultivating skills. It's actually through X-Men. And in X-Men, there's these characters that have different abilities. They're called mutants. One in particular, I had mentioned Mystique, but Mystique's ability is that she's able to shapeshift. And there's another uh, mutant named Rogue. Her ability is if she touches you, she temporarily takes your ability. And so I would get into arguments all the time with my friends about who's the strongest. And they would pick Professor Xavier, who has the ability to read your mind or move things. Or Wolverine, he's cool, he's badass. Claws come out his, his fists. And I was a strong advocate that Rogue was the strongest because her power was unlimited. Her power was basically whoever's nearby, if she can acquire their ability, she would temporarily have it. And I realized through books, I would temporarily, at least until it's more deeply ingrained into my habits and knowledge, acquire what an author has condensed into the form of a book. And so for me, connecting reading to acquiring abilities, it just opened up this whole new world for me. I didn't have to have mentors that live today. I could have mentors who have lived hundreds of years ago and like acquire their mindset, acquire their experiences to help me from my present day situation and the present day problems. I love this idea of, of having a mentor that doesn't have to be in front of us, that can be even dead, that, but they spent a lifetime putting, putting something together and acquiring that. If Giovanni Rogue sounds like a very nice one-two punch, <laughs> a very nice theme. A porn name, at least a a porn name. That'd be a great porn name for you. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I'm curious, man. I'm always curious when we have guests on, there seems to be at some point in their life on a topic that they're talking about, there's a a switch that was flipped. If something happened to go from, I do reading as a punishment and I don't want to, and I don't know why I'm reading this, to... I'm going to be the rogue of acquiring knowledge and acquiring superpowers. And I can do that through books. What happened there? So what happened was that my family got evicted. My father left the family. My mother couldn't afford the rent anymore. And we got kicked out the house and had to move in with my aunt. And that was a very traumatizing moment for me. I was probably around maybe 12, 13. I realized that uh, I would have to step up and become a man. My father wasn't there, but even though I was still a boy, I would need to become a man. And when I connected the dots that I can acquire these abilities or I can acquire these experiences through books, I deeply believe that can help me get there faster. And I had this deep, I would say, drive to get smarter faster uh, to help my family. And so that personal situation and that kind of 
big wake up call of like, okay, this is the real world. I think we can either be in situations or a particular environment that shelters you from the real, it's like shelter, but you're also sheltered from the real world. And I had no shelter and I got exposed to the elements. I got exposed to the real world very quickly. And fortunately that didn't turn into resentment or hate for the world. It turned into, okay, this is the real world. I better learn it. I better figure Mm. out how it works so I can use my mind to better navigate it. That was also a catalyst for me to cultivate more discipline, um, more self-control because all this chaos around me, I needed to at least control myself. And through learning through others' experiences and developing this map of the world, I was able to almost download that into my head, though I had the map to the game that I was playing. And I knew I was going through life on difficulty mode for the most part, (laughs) but at least I had some clues to help me navigate the maze. This is really beautiful. Something that you said that really struck me at the top of this podcast was this idea of curiosity as a privilege. I've never looked at curiosity as a privilege before. And you opened my eyes to, wow, like there are people in circumstances where curiosity just isn't available because we're in survival mode. And it sounds like that you were in survival mode and the only way to level up, the only way to get there to survive was actually through this knowledge. Yeah, You mentioned that you're a curious person, curious about life, curious about all those things, but it sounds like that's something that was cultivated and not what got you there originally. Yeah, curiosity had to be earned and Mm. it took a lot of sacrifices to provide the psychological safety to get to a place of feeling curious and not afraid and not overly focused on the dire straits of my my situation and to think in a more abundant, future-oriented mindset. Uh, I think it's beautiful, Giovanni. And You know, what I'm hearing from you is books were your gateway to other worlds, right? To tapping mentors. And I could totally relate to, you know, like Napoleon Hill. He's he's been dead for decades, but he's kind of the guy that like I look to and learn from on a regular basis because his work, his life's work has been canonized. And I love what you said about his entire lifetime worth of work takes me just a few hours to consume. Like the risk reward there is, 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 that's a beautiful insight. So now our listeners are starting to think of, okay, like what are these worlds that I would want to be able to explore? Let's bring it back now then to, you know, your list that you've curated. There's this purgatory and now you're on Goodreads and you're looking at the reviews and you're about to go to the, you know, you you don't read the five-star reviews. You tend to to, to look at a different kind of review that's more informative for you. Yeah. I tend to prefer the lower starred reviews. So I'll look at three star reviews. The one star reviews, it, it's, it seems like the five star reviews and the one star reviews are very low information mm-hmm. a lot of the times. And so I'll, I'll try to peek out those very well written three star reviews. Giovanni, yeah. I just realized something. Dominic and I, we need a noise button, like something that indicates great insight. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I am constantly reading because what Amazon shows you is like, here's the best review and here's the worst review. And what you're telling me is that's garbage. Go look for that really well-written three-star review. I love this. You just saved me so much time. You want to look in a place where the passion of the review does not trump the substance of the book. So you'll find very passionate reviews on the tail ends of the very passionate one star, a five star review, or very passionate one star review. And that three is where like, ah, this could be a five, or this could be lower. But this is why I didn't give it a higher rating. And there you get much more personal insights, much more insight into what is this book missing? Or what is this person's current situation? uh, Or what were their expectations before they read? And so I get a lot of good value insight into those middle three, four star reviews. And from there, I'll look towards my current situation and my current problems. And, and there is the aspect of certain books requiring prerequisites. So even if you're, you're, if you're going to school and you're taking advanced courses, you wouldn't just jump into the advanced course. You'll take the introductory course and then work your way up to the intermediate and then advanced. And oftentimes for books, people don't operate in that manner. They'll try to jump for like the biggest, baddest book, or maybe to be intimidated for that, or like a book that's like more shallow. And so really figuring out, okay, what do I currently know? How approachable is this book? What do I need to do to fill in the gaps? 
so that I can better absorb the material that I'm about to read. Hmm. Is there an example of, of that, like a, like a certain skill that you wanted to learn where you were like, okay, here's the entry level, here's the intermediate level, here's the advanced level? Yeah, oftentimes I find that with philosophy, so books about complexity or books about deep philosophy, I think psychology is often a, a prerequisite to philosophy. So starting out of like, okay, how does the mind work? Okay, this is how the mind works. Okay, how do people tend to socialize? How does human nature work? How do personalities form? And then there's like individual personality, and then there's group personality, and then all these different dynamics. And so you're thinking about the mind in context to people. From there, you can build up and say, okay, this is the mind. This is the mind thinking about itself. And so if you jump to philosophy too early, it can seem very abstract and very detached. But once you have a better foundation in how the mind works, at least to some degree, we're still figuring that part out too. Right. It's a little it, bit more approachable. You know, what's, what's interesting about that is a, a few years ago when I ran a men's retreat, Brian went on it and I, I required two books for, for men to read. And these are guys who are at the very beginning of their journey, right? They hadn't done a, a men's retreat before. They hadn't done inner work or read a lot of these books. And so I recommended Outwitting the Devil uh, by Napoleon Hill, and then The Way of the Superior Man by David Data. What I found was that like Outwitting the Devil unanimously was a hit. Like Everybody loved that book. The Way of the Superior Man, half the group was like, what the fuck was that? Like They just weren't ready for it because like it's not quite you know, super philosophical, but it's definitely you know, touching on that realm. It's, it's not nearly as concrete as, let's say, yeah. a, a Napoleon Hill book. And what you're doing is you're giving me some color for okay, how to actually know where you're entering in that system because it could either be the right stepping stone or if you jump in too deep, it could, it could be like walking into a, a 501 level course when you needed a 101. Yeah, exactly. And for sometimes that could be a, a disservice to people. Sometimes those more advanced books are most likely to like fundamentally change your worldview. Yeah. Um, but you have to operate at the current level and lens at which people view the world and speak in a language that they can consume first. It's very important to understand the context in which people are coming from. Giovanni, how do I, how do I as, a, as a consumer, know that there is a prerequisite, right? If somebody recommends something for me and it's about philosophy, uh, for example, the, Dominic, the book that Dominic just rec- that talked about, The Way of the Superior Man, I had no idea that was about philosophy or feminine or masculine energies. And when I first read that book, I hated it. It was awful. Now it's one of the more high impact books in my life. There's probably something I should have read prior to The Superior Man, The, the Way of the Superior Man. So how do you know when, when something's recommended to you? Like, the, is this a 101? Is this a 501 book? Yeah, oftentimes it, it, it is hard to know on surface level for yourself. I think friends, that's why re- recommendations are still important. So if someone knows you mm-hmm. and your situation, your personality, they can see what will resonate with you. And so that's from the recommendation angle. The other angle is understanding who are the author's masters and students and how Uh, how close are they to the origin of their truth that they're trying to communicate. Because what often, if someone is writing on a topic and they're not a master of it, a lot of the core message gets diluted. And then their students then further dilute that message. So you have to kind of go back and trace back to the origin. And so that's why older books that are more time tested and have a more anti-fragile approach of where the more or like the Lindy effect is uh, this dynamic of when you have something that lasts a long time and it's, it's also a very controversial topic, but it still has some truths to it. And there are pr- probably deeper truths to it. So books that are recently published from someone who is a student, not yet a master, but is acting as a master or expert, they'll tend to overcomplicate or add a lot of noise where it's hard to, to get the essence of the book. So that requires a little bit more work of understanding the background of the author. But usually friends and recommendations tend to have like a, a lot more accuracy as well. I just had that moment, Dominic, that you had in the van going up to the men's group where Giovanni started talking. And you're like, wait a second. If I was in that van, this would be the point where I said, pull it over. I don't care if we're late for the retreat. Pull it over. Giovanni's talking. Yeah, this yeah. is brilliant. I told master, you. Master, essence, 
This is beautiful. Thank you. Let's dive a little bit further into the reading of the books themselves, right? Like, so let's say you've chosen a book and I know one of your passions, Giovanni, is like this meta learning concept of learning how to learn. And Scott yes. Young, who we interviewed on, on his book, Ultra Learning, I know you're a fan, you know, his yes. whole process of ultra learning, which was one of our, which was a great podcast that, that Brian and I loved. It's like, how do you learn how to learn? And you have some like really specific techniques on how you choose to read books, the context in which you read books, how you can retain that information. So walk us through, like you've chosen a book or your six books that you're reading concurrently. Mm -hmm. How do you choose them? And then like, what's, how do you stage them and where do you read them? How do you retain all that information? Yes. So if you've gotten to a point where, great, you can now read a book. Okay, good. And so now you've really enjoy reading. You want to read more you have this problem of not having enough time or having too many books that you want to read. So then you try to read multiple books. Um, usually people will try to sprinkle them around. So there, there is a more structured way that I go about doing it and a couple other people go about doing it as well. And it's centered around this idea of uh, context-specific memory. So context-specific memory is taking some action at a specific point in time in a specific environment or place. So for example, we have context specific memory or habits that develop around what we do in the kitchen or what we do in the bathroom or what we do in the living room. And when we go into those contexts, like the habits don't require as much willpower when we're in that context. And we don't have to think about remembering what we need to do in those environments. So with reading, you can apply a very similar strategy. Say you live in a city and you take the train a lot. You can use the train ride as a specific environmental context, similar to like brushing your teeth in the bathroom. And you can read, uh, say the train is crowded. It may be a little bit difficult to take out a physical book. So you may choose to read on a Kindle. So you'll read a specific book only while you're taking the train, only on your Kindle. And you won't continue to read that book like randomly in your living room. And you could do this if that's the only book you're reading. But when you find that you're reading multiple books, what happens is that the stories and the narratives start jumbling and it gets blurry. And then you're requiring a lot more focus and effort to remember the narratives. So what I do is that I, I read across different mediums. So I read print, I read on my Kindle, and I also listen to audiobooks. I'll talk about how I pick what medium to read. But continuing with the context, um, so if you read a particular book in the context of a train ride, and then you read a, another book in the context of right before bed, and then you read another book in the context of relaxing in the living room, and you only read those books in those contexts, what you'll find is that you remember the narrative much, much stronger. You'll, retrain, you'll retain more information and you'll reduce the context switching because you're trying to reduce the context switching and then lock in the environment and the habit of reading a particular book so that the narrative sticks within that context. And so for the different mediums, usually someone will say like, okay, I'm busy all the time. I'll only listen to audiobooks, or I only like to read physical or print books. Going, circling a little bit back to the learning how to learn, what I've realized is I'm a very visual learner, but that's not the only way I have to learn because I've cultivated this ability to have almost like MMA I'll have mixed martial arts learning style. And what I do is I'll, I'll have a base style. It's like my foundation. And say some people, their foundation may be jujitsu or some people may be wrestling. Well, you'll find that in the world or competing, it's difficult to excel at just only that one thing. So you want to have a package and be able to adapt to the competitor or the situation. So even though visual learning is my foundation, I love podcasts. And so that's an auditory medium. But so when I'm listening to podcasts, I'll try to paint pictures in my head as I'm listening. And so I'll try to switch up my learning style and have an, an adapter. Say like for the Apple ecosystem, you have all these different adapters of what you use and you have this base input of lightning cable or USB-C and that's your primary, but you have these adapters that you're able to translate back down to your base input. And so for me, for learning, I need to translate back down to visual. So when I'm reading a book on print, I'll have a system to say, okay, my, the three mediums are print, audio, Kindle. On print, I'll read books that are worth rereading on print, things that I want to go back to, things that are very time-tested, 
things that I want to take a lot of highlights in. I mean, what are books share. like that for you? Yeah. Like what's a couple of examples of books like that for you? Books like that for me are, uh, a guide to the good life. The agent art of stoic joy is a really good one. The personal MBA by Josh Kaufman is another good one. Those are books that it requires a lot of integration. So things that are like very high quality and the, the knowledge in that book takes some time to integrate into my life. So they need to be physically in my environment. They need to be around me. There can't be too much competition or too many other distractions that are easily, that's going to make me lose focus from focusing on integrating. So physical books are books that I really want to like revisit and will take some time to integrate. And then when it comes to audiobooks, I'll tend to listen to fiction, history, biography, autobiographies, and memoirs on audio because the message highly resonates with that medium of audio. Things that are heavily narrative-based mm. are, are very efficient for that, that medium of audiobooks. Whereas if I wanted to read some book that is like very numbers-oriented or has a lot of charts and diagrams, I wouldn't listen to that on an audiobook because some of the message is lost in translation through that medium of audio. They're, the pictures are not there. I can't listen to the pictures, even if they're described. I need to see them. Ebooks I use for things that are recently published, not as much time tested. This may be a throwaway. I may want to skim it or scan around. The things that could have been a blog post, I don't want this to take up some shelf space. So things that are a little bit more ethereal, they can disappear. And I may still want to taste a little, I want to taste test, but I'm not going to like put this in my fridge. I'm not going to continue to to consume this for long. Yeah, Brian, I'm feeling I'm feeling quasi smart right about now cuz like I kind of stumbled upon a lot of the things that you're talking about here, Giovanni. I mean, audiobooks, for example, like two that really stand out to me are Michelle Obama's book Becoming because she narrated it in her own voice and you hear her story and it was like it, exactly. I, I remember driving out to Zion National Park one year ago like right around now and I can it, like that lent itself and then Jocko Willink's book that everyone recommended to me called Extreme Ownership, mm -hmm. like the Navy SEAL, his voice, like he sounds like he's coming through the, like the speakers and he's going to, he, he's in your room and he could kill you if you wanted to, but he's not, he's going to protect you. And that book is not really all that complex because every chapter starts with like a story. Here's the practical application to business, which is also another story. And like the medium is perfect, but some of these other books that are denser, richer in information, the idea of having it in my physical space where when I wake up, I see the book sitting there on my yes. counter and then I flip through and I see some of the notes I've taken. I didn't recognize how important that was for the retention of the information. Yes, exactly. Having something in your physical space is almost like a physical affirmation. Like you see it and you picture it. And that book, it's within your consciousness. Whereas if you have like 200 books on your Kindle, you may not see a, that cover again in a yeah. while yeah. unless you actively go and seek it. Yeah. And so we need to take our psychology into, into account and how we interact with the physical world and know the boundaries and know how we can, you, as we're shifting more into the digital world, what can we put in our physical space that's important to us, a priority? And to enhance our experience with that information even further. For that, for that reason, Giovanni, I actually ended up buying Michelle Obama's Becoming and also Jocko Willink's Extreme Ownership. I have hard copies sitting yeah. like over somewhere behind me over here. And you haven't reason. cracked those open. They're, they're trophies. I, they're totally trophies. I, I like have not. They're trophies, not yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like the person that catches and releases a fish and then has it taxidermied. But it's fake. It's a fake one because there's no <laughs> yeah, notes, there's no big. highlighters. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was that, that big. big. <laughs> I read it that fast. I took this much out of it. Sure, you did. I, I just see the trophy. Uh, Giovanni, you, you, so you saved me time at the beginning of this telling me to go to three-star reviews, not one-star or five-star reviews. Thank you for that. And now you saved me money because I can't tell you how many times I chose the wrong medium. And there's a multitude uh, of books. I mean, the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership never split the difference, Atomic Habits that I listened to on audio first, and then I bought the book like Dominic did, but I had to crack that book back open and start taking my notes on highlighting. And yep. So now I'm buying the audio book, I'm buying the physical book, and I'm spending too much money. And so this idea of, hey, if this is something you want to go back to, something you want to take heavy notes on, like maybe don't do that in an audio book. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. 
And I also noticed that I've, I've naturally gravitated towards that, that context specific learning. Oh man, that's so, that feels so real. I noticed that when I run, uh, I don't have to think I'm just running, whether it's a track or outside, I can take, I can consume a book very well, an audio book. Whereas if I'm lifting or doing something where I need to be using my mind, a podcast is great. And the train, because it's loud, I actually don't like to listen to a book and I'll read something on my Kindle. And I just notice I go back to that book every single time. I asked you so, about that, Brian, about, about why, why like in the gym, the podcast was better for you than a book. And I remember you saying this, this is stuck with me, was that like in a podcast, if you tune out for a few minutes because you're changing weights, or you're doing your reps, then like the cost switch, like you, you could get, jump right back in a few minutes later and you're not really going to miss much. Whereas with a book, like you could maybe miss the, the key point or the, the yeah. plot line or and like, and you yeah. may never recover from that. So that helped me too. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Most of the time, except for the great man within podcast where you have to listen to every <laughs> single syllable clearly, <laughs> especially when Giovanni's Obviously. on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, when, mostly when Giovanni's talking, not when I'm talking. <laughs> All right, dude. So context specific. Is there anything left on context specific reading that you haven't hit yet that would be important for us to know about? So context specific uh, memory also benefits from having strong associative memory. And so associative memory and associative learning, think of it like a, a network where you're connecting the dots. And so say you know about one thing, or if, if you know about colors, then your knowledge of colors will help you draw better or design user interfaces better or figure out how colors impact emotions. And so if colors impact emotions, how does that play into marketing? And so you build this connected dots of knowledge that helps you build more knowledge. And so it helps create more uh, surface area for context. And so related to books, what that means is that the more you read, the more that you break free from environment specific context and you now get into the terrain of topic specific context. So with topic specific context, which deals with associative memory, where you're trying to immerse yourself in a particular topic. So for authors, they often encounter this where they're researching deeply on a topic. They'll read the past works of other similar authors who have prior written about that topic. And then you get into synoptic reading where you're trying to, develop your own mini niche knowledge base about a topic. And so sometimes this can be to your benefit of picking similar themes and batching them together to kind of help it stick more. Or if you're reading about habits, it may help to get multiple uh, viewpoints about habits. So you may read The Power of Habit, you may read Atomic Habits, and then you may read another book, similar book about that. So you get different viewpoints. Um, as long as the authors don't directly reference themselves because you may hear the same thing too much. And this also helps with history where you can read history written by the victors and history that luckily has been written by the victims or the losers in that case. And you'll get two widely different perspectives about the same situation. So you can use that to help build a wider web, a mental net that will help you immerse yourself even further, you'll get beyond the surface level and you're much more deeper in a topic. I love that. My mentor in, um, in Australia, one of my mentors, his name is Matt Church. He recommended if you're, if you're looking to bring yourself up to speed on a particular topic, whether it's like habits or performance, he said, pick the number one bestseller that's out now. He said, pick the number one of all time in that category, like that lasting one. Mm -hmm. And then also pick one that maybe came out within the last 30 or 40 years that was, you know, that, that was widely considered to be a top. So you have like these three that can come together and give you the, the now version, the timeless version, and then a more contemporary version. I think we, we, had, we had Paul Brunson on this podcast as well, and he gave some, some similar advice to that in terms of stringing together the topics and the ages of, of the book. So that, that's starting to feel like a big, a big theme here. Yeah. And with, with Paul, one of the things that Paul did that was really helpful for our listeners was around retention of the information, right? And he had this process for at the end of every chapter, he would write a one sentence summary of what in his words that chapter was about. And then he would put the book down and then a week later he would revisit that and then like kind of go through each of them just to deepen the learning because a part of the memory process is, is repetition. So I'm curious for you, you know, what are some of your best practices around retaining specific themes and ideas that you picked up from books? 
I use different systems depending on the medium. Um, so I'll start with print books. So for print books, I started out with folding the pages. So I would fold like the top right corner of the book to kind of mark off important pages. And then from then I progress to writing in the margins. And so I would write some notes in the margins. But then I found that that was slowing down my reading too much. And I really depend on having good reading momentum to finish a book. And so I moved from writing in the margins to using post-it flags. So you may have seen like, these colored post-it flags. Sometimes a lot of college students will use them to like, label particular pages. So I'll use these color flags, and they're usually five different colors. And each color, I have a particular meaning for them. The intent behind flagging a book with a post-it flag is similar to like a, a think of a mining company. A mining company won't just like go to a line and say, okay, I think we should dig here. They'll do some preparatory work to figure out what they're getting into. And so for reading, that may be like before you open up the book, like read the table of contents to figure out the outline and structure of the book. And then once you have that sort of map of the land, my flags in the mining analogy act as the prospectors. They'll go out in the land. Now they didn't know the, the map of the land. They'll go out and mark the landmarks. So let's say, okay, you'll find this type of material here. You'll find this type of ore here. Don't dig here. You're not going to find anything. So I'll go through a book and I have these five colors that, I, that are part of the flags, blue, yellow, orange, green, red. And so for yellow, that's like a common highlight color. So I'll use that to highlight a common part of a chapter. Orange, I'll use to highlight something that the author has referenced that is very important to supporting his idea, his or her idea. Green, I'll use to mark a section that has repeating points. So maybe like, okay, first, such and such second, such and such, third, such and such, or they may list out multiple topics that branch out into chapters or branch out into definitions. And I kind of use that to save resources. I mean, those are important parts. And instead of using yellow flags and all of those, I'll use green to say like, okay, when you come back to this point, you may have to slow down because there's going to be a lot of notes mm. that you're going to take. And then I'll use blue to highlight the main idea of the book. Like these are like the big ideas that if I were to read all the blue highlights, I should be able to effectively summarize the book. And then this one is an advanced color, red. So red, I'll use to flag if it's something that I disagree with the author on, or I'm confused by, or something that I need to fact check or revisit. Love that. And so this I use, I'm being an active participant in the book. I'm having this kind of visual conversation with the author. Uh, through these flags. I'm kind of figuring out the shape and the color of the book, figuring out, okay, this author is using a lot of external re references, or this author isn't outlining his contents as much because there's not that much green flags, or it's very difficult for me to find the, the main idea because I'm not having as much blue flags. Giovanni, you must be a UX UI designer or something. Shock, <laughs> shockingly. Um, question for you on the flags. So do you, you mentioned getting, I like the analogy of the, the prospectors. So when you look at the table of contents, do you go through and start flagging before you read? Like, are you looking for certain visual I'll things flag or while, you I'm reading. That while you read? Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. I flag while it, cause I won't know what exists until I'm actually reading. Right. So instead okay. of stopping to write margins, I'll just flag now, when you put session. your trophies up on your, your trophy books, up on your bookshelf or whatever, however you do it, do you leave the flags in there? Yes. All my books. Okay. If you were to visit my library, you'll see all my yes. flags from all my past books. The purpose of the flag is that it's not just flag and done. I'll go back and transcribe mm -hmm. the flag notes. And so I want to type up like my own personal progressive summarization of a book using the flags as guiding. Because you're, okay. you're not just going to like find where oil is. It's like, oh, yeah, oil's here. Wave your flag. No, <laughs> I don't want to go and mine that bad boy. So mm. I go back and I'll type up my notes. And How long does that take you? I found that it usually takes me a little bit less than half of the read time, depending on the book. So if a book may take like eight hours to read, it may take me between like three to four hours to type up the notes. Wow. So you're committed to that. It's and, legit. Yeah. And you find that to be a good investment of your time. It helps me to really integrate the knowledge and have a personalized summary that I can go back and revisit. And you can maximize that value by sharing your notes. So I'm building out my blog now, Giovanni.com slash books. 
where I'm going and publicly posting my personal notes for the books that I read. So you can find ways how to repurpose this and create your own content as well. Love that. Absolutely. Okay. And you don't do this for every single book of like, say you read 60 books a year. You're not doing that for every book, but just the ones that you've chosen for like hard copy and the ones that you want to retain the information for. Ideally, I would like to do it for most books. I usually do it when I have more ample time. If you have a morning routine or a writing habit, you can kind of weave it into there and break it up into like 20 minute chunks. Uh, And the time will go by, like time is going to pass regardless of what you do. I find it to be very therapeutic. And the reason why I tend to avoid using summaries as the source of truth is that whenever you're summarizing anything, there's always bias of the primary author and they're using their priority system to figure out what's important, what they think is important. But when you're reading a book for you, what's important to you? Um, And that may be different from person to person. So it's almost like playing a game of telephone, where if it goes through too much summarization by too many different people, you lose the original message. Right. And so I'm trying to capture the original message that's important to me um, yeah. through the summarization. Yeah. And so to just even make this realer for, for our listeners is, you know, if you're going to dedicate six to eight hours to read a book or longer, right? I know one of the biggest frustrations that people have is just not being able to remember what they read or the key points of what they read. Mm-hmm. Some of the, the, the techniques that people will use is like the underlining or the, the page fold bending like you were talking about. Yes. But then eventually it's like when I want to go back and revisit, like, you know, I, that's a lot of work to go back through all the page fold bends and like the underlines. And, and so it's like, okay. And I, I went the other extreme when I started to underline and then write each of the key themes back in the inside cover of the book with a page number. And that caused the problem that you talked about, which is slowing down my reading. And that became like a l- laborious task. I'm really intrigued by this concept of the colored flags because that takes me from a place of passive consumption of information to Mm -hmm. now I'm constantly mining. I'm constantly looking for what's the key concept, what's the thing that I disagree with. And that, I would imagine in your experience, has triggered the retention. It significantly helps retention. And I think the reason why, I think a lot more people should focus on retention. Imagine if builders or engineers or architects were to to build a house. Um, It took years to build and they kind of never really did the work to make sure that things are, will stay up. They kind of like spend two years to build a house and then some storm comes and the house falls down. And I think similarly with reading, we try to build up this knowledge repository in our, in our heads and don't do that extra work to make sure that that knowledge will stand up. That knowledge is actionable and actually integrated into our life. And sometimes that may take some extra time. If you spend 10 hours reading a book and don't go revisit that information, if that book is important to you and you forget everything, you've already spent that 10 hours. Um, If you can spend two more hours to make sure that that information stays and sticks and is being put to use, that's kind of like lost opportunity. Couldn't agree more, man. All right, Giovanni, then what dangers do we fall into by just consuming books ad nauseum and and like filling our minds with all this information? Like, is there a possible way to overdo this or to do this the wrong way? Yes. Hell yes. (laughs) There is a way to go overboard with reading. If you're spending all your time reading, do you want to live a life in which you're consumed with reading and not living life? And so, Keeping the why front of mind, the intention that you have going into reading is very important. And there's also the, the danger of you get a lot of value from visiting other worlds through books and exploring new things. But the, at the end of the day, you need to live your own life and create your own world. And taking action from the books you read is, is very important because if you don't do that at the end of the day, it's just mental masturbation. So you, you really want to avoid that mental masturbation of being a kind of person who reads all the times, knows things, but hasn't experienced things, hasn't used that information to take action. It's goodwill hunting. It's like goodwill yeah. hunting, right? He's, he's like, you know, Robin, he's, he knows all the books and Robin Williams is like, yeah, but have you actually ever lived love? Yeah. Get out of Southie, go chase the girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so reading mindlessly can put you in a place where you continue to live in your mind and the world exists beyond your mind. Uh, so I think it's very important to have that, that balance. I like to look at the ratio of consuming versus creating. 
So if we're, if we're just downloading and taking notes and flagging books and putting them on our shelves and just constantly in that consumption, because even though it's pro, it could be productive, there's a reason, there's an intent, and using your word there, an intention behind why we read it. And so how much of that consumption is, is driving some of our creation? Yeah. And Giovanni, you said this on the bus ride up. Right? You were like, listen, even if I read 60 books a year for the next 35, 40 years of my life, I'm only going to accomplish reading a 0.0001% of the books that are, at, like, that are out there and the information that's out there. So at a certain point, it's kind of like asking yourself the question, what is this in service of? Right. And, exactly. and yes, of course, these are going. And I, and I look at like what you've done with your life. Like the books were a bridge for you to expand beyond just the few street blocks that you were talking about, like was, was the entirety of your existence for a while. And now here you are, like you're at Google, one of the world's most respected companies as a software engineer. And you've also started a, a number of networking groups, like communities that are thriving, that are giving opportunities to other people as well. So like you've taken this knowledge and actually created a life from it, not just become a, a closet mental masturbator. Exactly. You want to break that habit. Yeah, so man. I think, I think it's important to appreciate, be grateful for the opportunity to be curious, be grateful for the opportunity to even be able to read and having the time or resources to, to get access to that knowledge. But at the end of the day, what is it for? Who is it in service of? Does it make you happy? I think are a very important questions to ask. Nice. All right. What else you got for us, buddy? Yeah, I think, or I feel reading really helps me to be excited about life, be excited about other people. I found that reading helps me to connect with a lot of wide ranging individuals, people with a wide breadth of ideology. So I think reading can help us get over our, grow out of certain ignorances and biases. It can make us more empathetic. It can make us more compassionate. It can help us create a situation where we're way more capable to actually act on our ambitions, act on our missions. So I think there's a lot of good that can come out of reading and bettering ourselves. And I think it's, it's a, a responsibility or obligation. It doesn't have to be through books, but the core of it is just learning more about ourselves and learning more about the world and other people. And I think that can help us get to a place of continuing to do what humans have always done for a while. Like, not only survive, but thrive and pass on and compound knowledge to create a better world for the future. Yeah. When I first started looking at your book list on Goodreads, I was blown away by the breadth of topics that you consumed. And you know, I, I tend to see people who just kind of go down one silo of like productivity and performance or all of the arts or all philosophy, and you hit all of those categories. So like you live what you're talking about right now. Yeah. And so what I'm going to, I'm going to encourage everybody to do who's listening to this is go to the show notes and you'll see a link for Giovanni's Goodreads to connect with him. And you can also connect to me, Brian. I imagine we're going to be your first two friends. So get on there. I'm, I'm getting on. I'm getting an account today. Yeah, <laughs> please do. <laughs> And Giovanni, I believe you said you have a little bit of a, a recommended book list that you've curated just for our listeners. Why don't you hit us with that, man? Yes. Uh, so I have a list of, I was trying to narrow it down to three books, but I have six. So I'll just, right. I'll just give six books and I'll start with a fiction book. Is there a particular category? Are these just Giovanni's greatest hits? So I would say this is a, a mix of books to help us think about humanity, to help us be comfortable with the idea of death and be excited about the idea of life mm. and give us processes and tools to think of life as this abundant, infinite game. Good. So we're we're going to keep it really light. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> nice, and, nice and shallow. <laughs> Love it, man. Yeah. So the first book I'll recommend is a book called The Children of Time. It's a space-oriented uh, sci-fi book about what would happen if humans invented a way to create super smart humans, but this vial or medicine didn't end up in human hands. It ended up in some other species. And now the world has to deal with this other super intellect being or beings mm. and manage the ethical dilemmas of oh, seeing human nature in another animal's body. Wow. So okay. that's The Children of Time. Great. The other book I would recommend is a book called The One Thing. And Giovanni, while you're doing this, could you recommend the medium with which we would want us to consume? Oh, so that 
The yes. first book, what would that be? Yeah. So the children of time, I would recommend you listen to that on audible. The one thing I would recommend as print. Uh, so the one thing is a book about how do you go about choosing your priority right. as singular. Yes. The word priority has become pluralized. And because of that, we've lost sight of our actual priority. So this book provides a framework of how do you go about um, reducing multitasking, uh, reducing context switching, building up towards it the year and having a plan for focusing on the right thing. Uh, the next book I would recommend is a book called Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. This book won the Pulitzer Prize, and it's a very eye-opening book about what happens if society denies the existence of death. And we kind of are already living in that society in the way that we create this illusion of immortality. And what are the, the risks, the real risks associated with that being disconnected with our mortality, trying to hide our fragile nature? So this book is a very deep psychology book around the idea of death and what denying it can do to your own psyche. Read that in print. Next, and that would be in print. Okay. So. Um, the next book I would recommend on um, ebook or Kindle, Algorithms to Live By. So Algorithms to Live By is a book that takes concepts from computer science. And the type of concepts that it takes is this, the pattern of algorithms. It's just a step-by-step -step process in, or pattern a high-level pattern in which you have an input and then you have a predictable output. And so some of the examples from this book is like, how do you go about choosing how many people you should date before you actually like select the partner? So there are actually algorithms in computer science that go matching algorithms, the generalizable ones that you can apply to real-world situations like dating or finding a parking spot or finding think, figuring out what to get for dinner on uh, these kind of decision-oriented uh, algorithms. So that's algorithms to live by. The next book I would uh, recommend would be in print, Thinking in Systems. So this book helps you develop a mindset about viewing the world in forms of interconnected systems that have these dynamic relationships. And once you th start thinking about the world in systems, you view the world fundamentally differently because you realize that systems can be changed, but there's a cost associated with change and that can affect the rest of the system. But applied to your personal life, you can think about yourself in systems. What are the habits that you can cultivate that would lead to better results or better outputs? Or if you have a particular goal, you'll view that goal entirely dif differently instead of just like, how can I get to this result? Into what is the process that I can cultivate to lead to consistent outcomes. And then once you move from a goals mindset to a systems mindset, instead of thinking about, okay, how can I achieve this thing? You think about what are the repeatable things that I can do that if I do this, I'll eventually get to this outcome. And then the final recommendation I would recommend in uh, ebook, finite and infinite games. So the concept of finite and infinite games is finite games you play to win, and infinite games you play to keep playing. And so when you view the world from the lens of a finite game, it's very zero sum and infinite games are win-win. Um, so there are different examples in sports and companies and businesses where how you view the world either in finite or infinite terms fundamentally changes everything, the lens in which you view the world. So you move from a, a scarce to a more abundant mindset. Love that, man. I'm going to Beautiful. link all of those in the show notes. I'm, I'm shocked that actually only one of those books I've read, which is The One Thing, that's already on one of our lists. I think it's 18 books that every business leader must read. And you can download that at doinnerwork.com forward slash resources. We will link all of the books that you just put in the show notes. Please connect with Giovanni on Goodreads. And Giovanni, how else can people find you, man? Yes, you can find me on my blog. That's Giovanni.com, J-U-V-O-N-I.com. And also at Twitter, at Giovanni, at J-U-V-O-N-I. Dominic, two quick questions before we leave. Got to ask them. Giovanni, number one is, how do you arrange your physical books? <laughs> yes. Uh, so I arrange my physical books by category or genre. So I have all my business books on one row, philosophy books on one, one row. Well, my philosophy books are not enough to fill up a one row, but I have them intertwined with my psychology books. I was very tempted to organize my books by color. Yes, use, uh, yes, that is that. the big debate. I am a color person, <laughs> but hey, it, it says to each their own. Uh, there is no right answer here. Second question, and really also an important one, 
if you're willing to share, what is your dating status? <laughs> dating status. Oh, that's a risky question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the reason I'll give you some context here, Giovanni, because we are constantly getting, we, we have a large, even though the, the name of our podcast is the great man within, we have a large female following. And they're constantly asking us, how do we find well-connected men doing inner work? And just by this conversation, clearly, Giovanni, you're a guy doing that. And what the inquiring minds would like to know is, is this guy available or not? Again, no right answer. <laughs> I do not have the girlfriend is the, is the answer I'd like to provide. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That's great. He said it like he just, he just like I got a picture of you sitting like in Congress, like testifying or some shit with that answer. Yeah. Well done. All right. Uh, now we know. Hey, Johnny, thank you, man. This was uh, like he hearing a lot of this stuff for the second time, super useful. And a lot of the new stuff that you dropped is, is, is really wonderful. Looking forward to following your book list for this following year, but you've already given me five new books uh, that I got to put on my list right away. So thank you, my friend. Have an awesome rest of your year. Yeah, thanks. Keep learning, keep living is my message. Hey, Brian and I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for the ratings and reviews that you have left us over the course of this past year. Those really help inform which of these episodes resonate most deeply with you and help direct us for future content that we put together. If this particular episode on the ultimate guide to reading and retaining books was useful for you, then please let us know and pass it along to someone else that you think would benefit from it as well.